Thank you. And um, it really is, I know it's one of those things that we always say, it really is wonderful to be here. <laughs> and um, it's wonderful to be back with you and see um, lots and lots of familiar faces and a few less familiar faces. And I was just thinking that um, even since being back in this last week, there's some names that I've heard and I've said, oh, who's that? And I know that there are a few people that have joined our congregation in the last year or couple of years. But uh, even though I've been away for 10 months, before COVID, um, do you remember we were all still wearing our masks when I left? And so I'd see about this much of people's face. And so if I don't recognise you, I'm going to blame that. Um, so please do. If, if I've not met you, please come and introduce yourself to me because I really do want to get to know you. Um, and also I want to say thank you for your generosity in letting me have 10 months with my beautiful girl and with William. And um, I'm just really looking forward to her growing up in this church. And you've all got a role to play in that. So, uh, <laughs> so get to know her as well. Now, to, to the subject at hand, spiritual gifts. Um, we're looking today at second, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So open your Bibles there. And this is the passage immediately on, leading on from where Steve was last week. Um, it's a familiar passage for many of us. It won't be for all of us, but for many of us, we'll think, oh, yeah, yeah, I know that one. And it can be a bit easy to tune out if we think we know something. So I just want to, for those who think you know what this is about, just pay a particular attention. So we're going to read from verse 12 uh, to the end of the chapter, verse 31. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all of its part, many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong in the body, it would not, for that reason, stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong in the body, it would not, for that reason, stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But, in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honourable, we treat with special honour. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honour to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honoured, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, and all different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? He's, that's rhetorical, but the answer is no. <laughs> and then he says, now eagerly desire the greater gifts. There's loads there that we could get stuck into, and I'm not going to try to cover all of this. Perhaps that's a challenge for you to go away with this text and sit with it and see exactly what God says to you. But uh, unsurprisingly, I've got three things. Um, now, uh, the, the, the things, the, the points that I'm going to make do get more fulsome as, as we go along. But the first thing is, as I read this, it struck me afresh how wild, how mad it is that we are the body of Christ. Something that, for many of us, we're so familiar with this term, we use it um, as in a metaphor again and again, and so it kind of slips off the tongue. But Christ, the apex of history, Christ who um, 
There is no one in history who has been like him, who will be like him, in everything hangs together in Christ. And we are his body. Look around. You did this last week, but look around again. We don't look that special, do we? I have to say, you all look lovely. Steve said we're a good-looking crowd. But we don't look quite, you know, as fancy as Christ's body. And yet, that is what Scripture says we are. I know it's a metaphor. I know it's not a physical thing. But the ministry of Christ continues in the world primarily through the church. God's primary vehicle for work in the world is through his body, the church. He's got other ways. He can zap people here, there, and everywhere and do things independently of the church, but his primary vehicle is us. So we've got some work to do. Um, the, the, the ministry of the church, there's four things, really, that the church, uh, the body of Christ, is called to do. The first is to glorify him, like we've been doing, worshipping him in song, worshipping him with our lives. The second is to represent Christ. We are the representation of who Jesus is to the world, to people who don't know him. Preparing the bride for the wedding. Now, that sounds like a really weird thing, doesn't it? But Steve was talking about this future age where all things will come together, there'll be this joining together of heaven and earth, where all the rights will be put wrong, where everything will be filled with the presence of God, the spirit of God. And uh, scripture talks about uh, this image of Jesus as the, as the bridegroom and the church as the bride. And that there will become a time where there's a kind of a marriage between Jesus and the church. And part of our work is getting ourselves ready, sorting ourselves out, uh, doing the work that we need to do in order to become that beautiful, beautiful bride that gets presented to Jesus at the final day. And the final thing is to participate in, in the kingdom agenda, which is uh, the, the Father's plan of heaven coming to earth, that we get to participate in that, not just here on a Sunday, not just in our small groups, but in our places of work, in the community fridge, uh, in your families, wherever you end up being, we have a role to play. And so for, this, is, this is important, being the body of Christ. And the first thing just for me was I felt um, some... I felt convicted about all the times that I've disavowed parts of the church, where there's parts of the church, not necessarily Brooklyn Baptist Church, but parts of the church globally or historically, where I've said, well, that's not part of me. I don't want to be part of that. And what's it saying here? You can't just say, well, I'm not, a, I'm not that, that part, and so I don't, I'm not part of the church at all. So where, where Paul's saying, I can't say I'm not an ear, so I'm not part of the body. Just because you're saying you're not part of it doesn't make you not part of it. Um, we are all connected. There is unity globally and throughout history. And so as we say yes to being part of the body of Christ, and we say yes through baptism, we're saying yes to all of it. With all of its diversity, all of its brokenness, all of its failure, and all of its beauty, we're saying yes so that's the first thing, this extraordinary thing that we are the body of Christ. The second thing is about the diversity that we see here. Now, we've got these lists, haven't we? We're talking about apostles, teachers, prophets, miracle workers, tongues. And um, I don't know about you, but I've, there have been times in the past where we've tried to list all of the different gifts that are listed in the New Testament. And it's a bit confusing because different lists have different things. And even if you jump forward a couple of chapters, Paul gives a slightly different list. And it's almost like he's doing that deliberately to say, yeah, that's not all of it. This is just an example of some of the gifts. We can think it's maybe a bit of a muddle, but it's not a muddle. It's, it's just beautiful diversity of gifts that God has given the church. I was thinking if I were to ask a gardener, uh, what are the, yeah, tell me about, give me a list of flowers. There might be, they would say roses, daffodils, chrysanthemums, pansies, you know, list off a certain amount of, of, of flowers, so maybe some of their favourites, maybe some of the most obvious ones. If I asked them to give another list, a list, the same list again, they'd probably give me some of the same and a few different. Same with dog owners. If you ask a dog owner about breeds of dog, they would probably say Labrador, Golden Retriever, you know, Cockapoo, whatever. And then if they gave me another list, they'd give some of the same and some different ones. And that's kind of what's happening in scripture. 
what we, what we have here isn't an exhaustive list. So, so we can look around the church and say, yes, I can see so-and-so is a teacher. I can see so-and-so has a particular gift for healing. But I'm, I'm not on that list. So maybe my skills and my gifts don't count. And that's just not true. That's not true. There's the kind of high-profile visible ones, like the apostles, prophets, teachers, people a bit like us that you see at the front. And then there's the what sometimes called power gifts, supernatural ones, slightly wacky ones, but really interesting. Maybe just say eccentric rather than wacky. Miracles, healing, speaking in different tongues. Then there's the kind of backroom gifts that are still listed here, helping, guidance, administration. Administration, often you think of spreadsheets and emails, don't you? It's not just that, it's governance, it's leadership in bringing things together. Compliance. Mm, yeah. <laughs> and then there's loads of unlisted ones. Musicians, we haven't had musicians listed at all, and yet we haven't we been blessed this morning by our musicians. Techies, the people at the back. Coffee makers, children's workers, premises experts, numbers bods, people who look after the finances. Compliance geeks, risk assessment aficionados. They're not in here, but we need them. The encouragers, the ones that um, notice if someone isn't quite themselves. The mediators, the welcomers, people like Roma, who will be a bit rude and a bit funny. <laughs> the florists, we've still got the silk flowers, so we need your florists to step up, please. The intercessors. The justice warriors. I could go on and on and on and on. We have got so many gifts that God has given us that aren't listed here, and it doesn't mean they don't matter. It just means there isn't enough space to list them all. And also, we have blends of these gifts. We're not all just one. We all, many of us have, or lots of us, have lots of these gifts. And so each of us is unique. Not just an array of gifts, but an unlimited number of uh, combinations of gifts. And verse 18 says, God has placed all the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. It's like he's taken joy and delight in saying, oh, I need a Roma here, and I need an Edna there, and I need a Luke here, with all of their blends of gifts. We've been given by God to one another. Now, important probably to say that um, Paul was using a well-known um, metaphor. The body was used in by Greco-Roman orators to talk about society. You'd have the emperor as the head. You'd have the kind of noble dignitaries as the very special parts of the body. And then you'd have the less valuable, dispensable, hidden away bits of the body that you wouldn't really talk about. And so Paul is taking this well-known metaphor and he's spinning it and he's saying, you know that story where only the people that are visible are important? That's not true. Every part of the body, the spleen, the pancreas, the intestines, all the bits that we don't even know about are important and valuable to God. If we go back to creation in Genesis, God says uh, that humans basically are the pinnacle of creation. They are very good. And he doesn't say most of the body, most of the human is, is very good, except that bit that I got a bit wrong that's a little bit dodgy, that's not quite as good as the rest of the body. He says, the body is very good. And that's what he says of the church in all its variety. And the final thing I noticed about this, and this is uh, <laughs> the bit which kind of alarmed me and disturbed me. And I always think it's important when you're looking at scripture to really pay attention to those bits. The very last verse of this passage, verse 31 it says, now eagerly desire the greater gifts. And I knew that was there. And I thought, the greater gifts? Haven't we just been talking about how they're all equal? And they're all good. So I went, as any Bible nerd would do, went to the original text, went to the original Greek, and tried to pick at it, excavate it a bit, and think, it probably didn't mean greater gifts. It probably meant equally good gifts. <laughs> and it didn't. Actually, it sort of doubled down on this, this is actually quite a weak translation of it. So if we just go on to the next slide. So the word here is mezona. The root word is megas, as in mega gifts. <laughs> Abundant, 
arrogant, big, fierce, large, loud, mighty, strong gifts. Oh, <laughs> this wasn't what I was expecting. And, and as I went to this, I thought, oh, that's a bit repulsive. Um, doesn't make me feel very comfortable in my British, quite introverted, um, like to think I'm humble sort of attitude. Now eagerly desire the mega gifts. So I thought maybe eagerly desire, maybe it doesn't mean that. Yeah, it does. Um, so apparently it's an onomatopoeic word, this word, zelu, zelu, something like that. I can't say it in Greek, but um, it's meant to sound like boiling water, like bubbling over because it's so hot, to burn with zeal, to be so deeply committed to something, to be earnest, to set one's heart on something and to be completely intent upon it. So it's, we are meant to be zealous about desiring the mega gifts. <laughs> it doesn't sound very humble, does it? And um, this is truth. We believe that this is truth, and so we need to listen to it. We need to pay attention. But as I was talking to Steve about this, I was thinking this is a bit like a sandwich. What we've just had is Paul at pains to say, no one is better than anyone else. You're all equal, you're all valuable. And then the next chapter that we're not going to look at is that one that famously comes out at weddings, the love chapter, about how important love is. And Paul basically saying, if you don't love in equal measure to the practice of your gifts, it's a complete waste of time. So we've got this sandwich of everything, everyone's equal, and the other bit of bread is, and you need to hold your gift in equal measure to the amount of love that you have. But the, the filling of the sandwich is, and you need to be... Uh, zealously desiring mega gifts. So let's hear that. And I just want to say, I don't have time to, to go into this in great detail, but let's hear that challenge. So I was thinking, if we as the church, with all of our work that we have to do, bringing in God's kingdom, representing Christ in the world, if each of us were to eagerly desire the gifts God has given us, and maybe new gifts in greater quantity, what difference might that make if we were to be actively pursuing an increase in our abilities, an increase maybe in the amount of gifts that we have, and practicing them, releasing them like those balloons? I know for me, I've been doing that over the years with teaching. I know it's a gift God's given me, and I've been working towards it and praying and studying and watching how other people do it and trying to learn but I have never had the boldness to say, I want, for the sake of the kingdom, to be a great teacher. And yet that's what Paul is saying. And so what's he saying to you about the gifts that you have? What does it look like for you to be a brilliant, a great, a mega welcomer, a mega children's worker, a mega musician? And that is what I believe God is saying, is, is calling us to more more of us engaging ourselves with the process of learning and becoming uh, great in those things, but also praying and making space for God to move and to do the things that only he can do. The Spirit of God can do things we cannot do for ourselves. And so we need to make space for him so that he can fill us afresh and move us on into those greater things that he's called us to. And with that, I am going to close and hand you back to Steve. Just um, an applause, because sometimes we're, we're very British and we think we should be, you know, we shouldn't be doing that kind of thing, but actually to express an appreciation, even, appreciation, even a well done to one another can do amazing things. Um, to the, the gift of and, and in the midst of a sermon, the odd amen can be incredibly encouragement, can't it? It's not necessarily so much our culture, but let's, let's be a little bit more vocal, a little bit more forthcoming. Now, um, 